happen here on RTE2. Now though, forget one man up front as two of Ireland's top goal scorers join the second captains live. The Republic of Ireland bandwagon is slowly inching its way towards France 2016 and we're joined tonight by some of the biggest names in Irish football. We're the second captains. We're live. And this is Second Captain's Victory. Did everyone enjoy Shane Long's 25 yard screamer on Sunday night? Yes. Yeah, We've got two of the all time greats with us tonight. Niall Quinn is back on the second captain's couches, and our big guest is one of the most gifted players ever to wear the green jersey. He even had a much coveted place in the good wall before being cruelly taken down by Luke Fitzgerald last week. Liam Brady will be right here a little bit later. <laughs> Both of these legends, Niall and Liam, have had many experiences against last Sunday's opponents, Ken. Yeah, and here's Liam lining out against the Poles in 1984 in a day when it seems we were managed by a, a Cuban drug lord. Scarface had hit Irish screens <laughs> earlier that year. <laughs> Owen Hand, clearly a fan. That game also marked the debut of this well-groomed young hunk of officer material. Ooh. Mick McCarthy, who cycled home after the game on his hipster fixie. Mal Quinn <laughs> almost broke Polish hearts with this wonder strike in 91. That game finished nil-nil on an afternoon when somebody selling white flat caps to Irish fans became a millionaire. <laughs> but to us, the highlight of that day was probably this. As always, on occasions such as this, a cruelly Irish mascot makes his entrance as well. There's not really any nice way to say this, but did McCool shit himself? Just right there. Oh. Yeah, so. Send us in your McCool memories, uh, because we have no recollection of that guy. Richie hmm. Sadler is also here this evening. And no, Richie hasn't played against Poland. Come on, everyone, I know what you're thinking. You want some sort of gag to do with Richie Sadler only getting one cap for Ireland, while Liam Brady and Niall Quinn have loads of him. It's not going to happen. Richie's one of our favourite voices on football, and I can't remember his lack of international success ever affecting his punditry career or causing any awkward moments. In, in, in a big match like this, I was very lucky. I played in matches like that. So did Didi. I, 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 don't, not, not somebody, I don't mean that disrespectfully. Yeah, I was very lucky. I played in matches like that. So did Didi. I, 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 don't, not, not somebody, I don't mean that disrespectfully. Yeah, well, uh, apart from that one, 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 one small okay, awkward one moment. moment. We'll okay. crown a Twitter king or queen by the end of the night. The bar has been set pretty high by last week's picture of England's Billy Vunapola as a physically imposing 10-year-old. Yeah. If you think your tweets can touch those heights, go for it. At Second Captains, the hashtag is Second Captains. We're delighted to have one of our Twitter favourites, Amy O'Connor, taking care of the account for the duration. It's time to get our first guests out here. And what a panel. Let's hear it for Richie Sadler, Owen Kelly and Niall Quinn. <laughs> Niall and Richie, welcome back, and Owen, welcome here for the first time on Second Captain's Live. Before we get into this chat, actually, does everyone want to see the Shane Long goal one more time? Ah, yeah. Cool. All right, go on, then. Hoisted towards the back, Hula had to send it in. I love these replays because you can just see how clean and crisp this strike yeah. is. Just a pure hit right off the back still. <laughs> <laughs> Owen, you're recently retired after giving Tipperary fans a lot of joy over the last number of years. A couple of All Irelands and there's one Tip fan in the house. Six, uh, six All Stars, a couple of All Irelands. I presume everyone in Tip is quite happy with Shane Long after the night. Oh, it would be, especially after last week on the show, you uh, give Bobby Ryan a hard time. So it was <laughs> nice that yeah, the nation had turned to Tipperary man to, to pull Ireland out of fire last weekend, but. No, look, Shane was a great Tipperary underage hurler as well, and uh, definitely one we, we lost to the, the soccer, but he, he's a super talent, and uh, 
Can't wait to see him play the next day of Ireland. Do you yeah. tend to watch the international football through that Tipperary prism? You've got Niall there, who's <laughs> uh, half tip, half Dublin. You would. You try to hang on to the lads when they're from tip. You, you hate letting them go. So, no, look, um, I follow the Ireland soccer team, especially with Martin O'Neill, Roy Keane involved. You know, they were players when you were younger. You would have looked up to Roy Keane big time, and it's great to have a guy like Shane Long involved. You know, he's a, you know, he's a fantastic athlete and. Uh, I think he's definitely one that'll have to be playing the next day against Scotland. Niall, I watched your analysis on Sky after the game and essentially it boiled down to you feeling that Ireland, under Martin O'Neill, we can get a little too bogged down in fancy tactics. You think maybe get a couple of big lads up front <laughs> and get the high balls in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it worked before. Um, I, I suppose, looking back at it, uh, we, we have a, a certain set of players with a certain set of skills and I think it breaks down at times, you know, we're not a fluent passing team that can suddenly take on the likes of Poland. They totally dominate us. I think there was a, a wonderful thing happened at half time. I think Martin O'Neill, if anybody wanted to know what he was about, half time said it for me. Martin O'Neill got that team out to completely turn around and they became a more attack minded. They put two people up front and they got more direct. I'm not saying they launched ball after ball, they didn't because both the fullbacks, Brady, came out and had a great second half and Coleman did. They just became more attack minded and they had two people up front as opposed to Robbie Keane on his own, which just does not work. I mean, uh, he said it in no uncertain terms a few months ago in Scotland. But you would like game. to see the two big lads playing and a, 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 well, a, little, a little bit more of a back to basics. Well, I wouldn't say two big lads. I'd, I'd certainly like to see one. Um, young Wilkes and the other 21s, they say, might be one who's coming through, who could be looked at, who could fill that role. And, and Jonathan Walters, he looks as if he can cause problems right where it matters in and around the, the danger areas as opposed to be doing a, a kind of a, an up and down job on the wing which he does for us which, and, and of course he never complains but uh, the crowd as well they enjoyed the second half performance they enjoyed the, the sort of I suppose I hate saying this thing but they put them under pressure type way that the second half went for us I know that's bad isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we're really going back in time yeah, yeah, yeah but, but it's just what we are and right now we're, we're, we're ranked in the in the mid 60s as, as a team and uh, Will we suddenly, with a new manager and, and a great player used to play for, suddenly turn that team into a top 10 team by, by outplaying players who play in top Premier clubs and top international teams? I, I don't think so. I think we've got to find something different. Well, Richie, what do you think? Is, is, should a Martin O'Neill play with the sort of passion and intensity that Niall is talking about? Or can we aim for something a little better, something a little prettier on the eye, maybe? Well, we've never been a country that's played pretty football, however you want to describe that. But... What I thought was great about Sunday night, not only did the pace and the tempo and, and the passion and all, particularly in the second half, but it, the crowd and everything, it was a proper match. It, I've particularly working on it, but if I wasn't working on any, any of the games over the last few years, I would have been there as a supporter. And it's been so flat for ages. The Trapatoni stuff went really badly wrong near the end. And then there was like a year of friendlies under O'Neill. And it doesn't matter how much people say it's great to play for your country in a friendly. It's just a friendly. And the other night it was brilliant. The whole thing was just completely different from what we've seen. But we'll never be a pretty team. We'll never be a team that looked to outpass teams. But it was the best we've played through the night. But we're not exactly distance. inundated with big guys now no. or really physical players. Is it, is it a bit of an abdication of responsibility to say, right, we can do this by outmuscling them and, and, be, and being more intense? Should we not be looking for a way to actually be smarter than those other teams? Yeah, and I think that where I think this conversation is headed, whenever this comes up, it's about Wes Houlihan. And then he's a player that can do something that no other player does. You know, when we have a pre-match discussion and we decide whether a manager, what's he going to play? And there's this fascination now on numbers as a 4-4-2, 4-2-3-1, and all these numbers mean something. But if Wes is one of those players, he completely changes how the position is played compared to any of the other teams in the squad. So when he plays, this Irish team can play differently. When he doesn't, the options are a little bit more limited. Niall? No. Well, I suppose he was accommodated in the lineup the other night, which was great because he has, hasn't always had that under Trapattoni. It was a, a relief if he got on for half an hour in the friendly. Mm. So, so, you know, Martin recognises that he has that extra ability that he can bring to it. But Martin is a, a past master at putting teams out to do a job. You know, he, he got Aston Villa to go up into the top six of the Premier League. He didn't have uh, the money of a top six club. You know, he, he, he just worked on, got a bit of pace on the wings, got a, you know, a, a little bit of direct. He had crew, he had people like that playing up, up, up top. Uh, he's always played with, with that kind of a player. Uh, Leicester City, of course, um, you know, where, where, he, where he made his name, he would have, he would have done the same. So I just, I just have a feeling that we're going to end up going that way anyway. So forget about the three, five, twos, ones, all mm -hmm. these different things that we're, that we're saying is out there. And you can do that and accommodate a Wes Hulhan in the side if you've got 
everybody geared in and switched on to what's happening because as people are starting to go forward and putting uh, say, say, say the wingers going forward and putting more intense pressure you know that's when the likes of Whelan you know they, they, they've got their job to do then to you know and, and that's you know you, you, you might laugh at me you might say it was a long time ago but Jack Charlton had one thing going right he, he overdid the, the, the lump and the high balls I'll, I'll never ever deny that but it was more when we weren't in possession we drew matches if we had a bad day if we had a bad day, we drew matches because we held on to that, that space where we did. And he used to say it. He was kind of a little bit ahead of his time in many ways. Uh, nobody played with one up front in those days. And he used to ask us, uh, he, Frank Stapleton was the first he asked, and, and I was one, the second one he asked, when we lose the ball, you become a fifth midfielder. So he was doing what Alex Ferguson changed in the Premier League 20 years later, and which everybody does now. Mm. You know, uh, Carlos Quiros made Alex Ferguson do it in his time, and they went on and won titles, and nobody knew how to handle it. So, so there was a little bit of that in the thinking, and I think Martin is a bit like that. He understands that, you know, Ireland are in trouble on the break if they play 4-4-2. But if you gear your team up to play it, and if you, you know, you have Whelan and McCarthy, and you have, you have them solid enough uh, on that, and knowing that if they lose the ball, we have to get back here, and if that Walters, who I think is the ideal candidate to drop back as soon as we do lose it, try and make a five as best you can, and then that allows room for a Wes Hulan. Now, that, that's the way I see it. Two big international matches over the last week or ten days, Richie. Do you think the rugby players are still, or maybe not still as you know the word, do you think the rugby players are more loved by the Irish public than the soccer team is? Well, they're winning tournaments. Like they're in the top three in the world. They're, they're, they're winning the Six Nations. So it's a lot easier to get praise and respect and media adulation and all of those things if you're doing that. I think... Th I think footballers and rugby players are treated differently um, by the media. I, I, I think even in conversation, when I, and, and the GA lads the same, the, the wages the footballers earn, someone will always mention that to me in a conversation. I can't go to Croke Park without someone saying, oh, them lads get nothing, you know that. And, 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 <laughs> that, and, there, and there's this, there's that kind of thing, and then the rugby lads don't get with the football lads. So I think when it's in the press that you're on 60 or 90 grand a week, there tends to be less tolerance when you have a bad day or if you're not doing really well or if you're not running around look like this match means the world to you. And in rugby you can look like the match means the world to you very easily because you can just charge into the bloke next year and <laughs> it's going, look, he, it means a lot to him. If you do that in soccer, mm -hmm. you'll get sent off and we'll all do podcasts and columns ripping this player to pieces for being unprofessional. Oh, and do you get that sense? Well, in a poor game of football, like that's, that's, what's, that's what comes up ultimately, the mm. wages. That's the argument, you know. Like, and then you'd make the argument with the rugby players for the hits and the tackles they put in. They don't go, get paid enough. But I, I'd notice with the GA players now in, in the GA world the last couple of years, like, there's more scrutiny on the players. And I even found in my own county, Tipperary, like, you know, after games when you'd maybe get defeated, you know, lads go socialising maybe on the Monday and that, you know, uh, with your own teammates, because you're with them all season and they're the guys uh, you're in, in, in the training pitch with, and when you lose, you know, that defeat, you want to go through it together, like, and, you know, national media get hold of these stories in, and they, they blow them out of proportion. Yeah, and like, you, you, know. you can't step away in, 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 the, in a similar way to the way professionals can. Professionals can just disappear into their own bubble, whereas... That's the thing, they yeah. disappear, and, like, look, I suppose if it hits the national media, then the wages uh, that they're getting on weekly, you, you don't mind it too much, you know, but it's... Um, definitely the GA players are coming under, under scrutiny, but mm -hmm. I think Richie has a good point. When you're winning, like the Irish rugby team. You know, that's a, that's okay. a huge, yeah. I love the notion that you think footballers are in a bubble. You still do your shopping, you still walk your dog. <laughs> <laughs> like you still, you still, huh? Jesus, I remember many times being in Millwall where you don't do well on a Saturday. It matters. Yeah. The, 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 the local town interacts with you very differently than when things go well or badly on a Saturday. This notion that everyone lives in this massive big house with these big walls and don't interact with non-footballers, that's not really true at no. all. Yeah, the same, same so on, but just going back to, to the point, of, say the GA rugby soccer, soccer had its time where it was where the rugby guys are now because we, we were in good shape and the, and the people took to it. Uh, the problem, where, where the soccer started to go a little bit wrong if we, if we track ourselves back, was as the whole Jack Charlton thing unfolded, the rugby guys with the money and the suits took all the seats. And the ordinary punter couldn't go to the games. If you remember those time in the 90s when the ordinary punter could not go to a game who had gone for years because, you know, the FAI had commercialised the, the, the whole thing and, and perhaps rightly so in the way, the, way the, the soccer world goes. And now the rugby guys are the ones saying, oh, well, you know, rugby is so much better. Our guys are so much tougher. But it'll come. If Martin O'Neill brings this side to the Euros, it'll soon come back. Uh, yes, rugby is there now and, and they have to be emulated. I think that the soccer lads have to say, look, we, we have to follow that um, follow that lead that they're doing but you know it, it's 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 like everything else success and failure you know I, i've seen him 
being paraded as a king down in Tipperary, and then people, <laughs> people within six months, you know, going, oh, that Kelly's not at it at all. You know, it, it's just the way it is. Yeah, well, I don't know if the soccer lads maybe got out of their bubble a little bit for long enough on Friday night to go and see Ike Eno in the Olympia. <laughs> this was a little bit of a team bonding exercise around Roy that was there. He was absolutely delighted yeah, with really. proceedings as we can see. Theater fan <laughs> Ike Eno is, of course, based on events in Saipan featuring Niall Quinn, among others. But in the run-up to this series of Second Captains Live, we were tipped off about an even more spectacular theatrical production mm. based on the life of our own Richie Sadler. Yes, everyone, <laughs> I'm talking about Bust the Opera. This yeah, is not an April Fool's. This, this actually, actually happened. happened. This production Production was unleashed on the world in 2013 in the Garter Lane Theatre in Waterford. It is an opera based, based on, the, on career the career of the footballer <laughs> Richie Sadler. Yeah. Richie, you've kept this secret for too long. For 18 months, I've kept this hidden from you. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I meet you, I'm dreading so, it to find out. Yeah. So, did you did you ever go and see it? No, the f <laughs> can't believe I'm talking about this. The fella. He contacted me and, and invited me down, and I actually couldn't go down to it. I think it was in Waterford or something. Yeah. Um, I would have been mortified. Going there, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what that would have been like. But yeah. It's like uh, Jake LaMotta going to see uh, Raging Bull in the cinema or something. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, would you like to see some of it? Yeah. Oh, I think God. we'd all like to see oh, yeah. a little bit of it. Uh, incidentally, <laughs> incidentally Big we, do, we do happen to have a few scenes. Uh, so uh, here's uh, Richie having just arrived in England, hoping to make a breakthrough into the first team, but things aren't going great <laughs> so far. When I was a kid, <laughs> I dreamed about all Here's Richie there. <laughs> Does he ever get to play in those grounds? I'm afraid not, because we must now, I'm afraid, Richie, move to the dreaded injury scene. Uh, our hero makes the first thing, and things appear to be going so well before disaster strikes. <laughs> Exactly, they brought back a load of memories there. It's mm. exactly how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's like looking at it's documentary footage in a lot of ways. Richie, your career and Niles overlapped and interlinked in a lot of ways. Was he a player you tried to emulate growing up? Well, I kept getting asked about him. In, in every interview I did, actually, with English press, they would always make the comparison with me and Cascarino because he played with Millwall. But any of the underage international matches that I, that I played in, the media, you do all these interviews and else. So, is it Niall Quinn you want to be like? Is, is he the place you want? And, and it was always this question constantly. What was your answer? What do you say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, what do you say? You know, no, he's crap. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you just come out with this, oh, yeah, you know, he's a legend, great player, all that usual nonsense just to try and get away from <laughs> how, was, yeah. how was he when you finally made it in and played for him? No, it was great. Well, like, a couple of, I don't know, should I say this? No, you can't fire away. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he rang me a couple of times. Um, I suppose it's an illegal approach, is what you would call it. Tapping, right? tapping up, tapping right? up, yeah. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah, so yeah. we had a couple of phone calls about trying to get transfers out of Millwall a couple of times, but mm -hmm. even in the week that when, when I... You probably won't remember this, oh. in the, the Cap, the Russia game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the bus on the way to the match, I kind of knew I'd come on at some point. I knew I wasn't starting, and, 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 and he, just sat in the, he just sat in the seat next to me and, and just kind of belittled the whole thing. Just me. So, well, you're only going to go out and do what you've been doing since you're about seven or eight, so just go out and do it again. And I think in those terms, said, yeah, this is going to be a doddle. Um, but even remember that the previous night, when, when we had the... We tried to organise who's the match tickets and who's going to do the advertising and merchandise and stuff in the build-up to the World Cup, you, were, you and Staunton were, were leading the meeting and it was like, it, we'd all to fill in this sheet. And I was feeling like a bit of a dick even being in the room. <laughs> so he, he, you kind of handed me the sheet, kind of how many match tickets and all you want. And I went... There's hardly any point in me filling this out. And you, you just kind of rub it and said, listen, shut up. Probably swore a little bit and said, well, if I don't go, you're going and my back can go at any day now. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember going, Christ. <laughs> That's <laughs> this, the World Cup. Yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. But it was, it was, mm-hmm. yeah, it was yeah, a long time I, ago I, now, I, yeah. I was, I was fond of Richie as a player, not, not, you know, for any reason that he was Irish, but we, we actually saw him at Sunderland as somebody who could, who could go and do the next stage at Sunderland. And sadly for, for Richie, and it's a tough thing to talk about, yes, there was a tapping up at the time. Um, Can we maybe elaborate on the... <laughs> Peter, Peter Reid, literally, he, he, at, at the stage of my career I was at, um, had said to me, you know, I want you to be my number two. Uh, we'll kick on again. We need to reinvent the team. Uh, we've got all these different people that our scouts are telling us. And I went, well, I'll, I'll take the job, but um, Richie Sadler should be at the top of that of that queue. And he said, yeah, we've got good reports on him. Will he do it? And I think that's when I, that's when I got in and touch. I said, and I said the thing about the injury. Well, it, it was, <laughs> so, well let, let me, about, about that as well. He said, no, I, I don't think I'd pass the medical because I've got a hip injury at the moment. And I went, well, get yourself right. We'll wait. Uh, Sadly, the Sunderland chairman, Bob Murray, didn't wait because he sacked Peter and brought in Howard Wilkinson, who said there was no job for me. So uh, I was living back in Ireland. I bumped into you, I think, and said, oh, sorry about that. It didn't work out for either of us. Yeah, but, it, yeah. but it was... This is a bad night. Yeah. That was a bit of fun, but this yeah. is actually <laughs> real. This has uh, set me back years, this conversation. <laughs> but, you know, another thing happened then as well. So when I went back to Sunderland some years later, and brought the uh, Drummerville group back and Roy came and all the rest of it. Uh, when I got there, Richie was actually, you were doing recuperating, trying mm. to get back, and, and because Mick McCarthy had, had invited him to do that. So I was delighted that Richie was there. And we did, we did try, and, and hope, we hoped, and we said, we'll try and find a, a medical route that would allow Richie back into the, to the fold. And we got very close to that, mm. you know, and, and that, that's probably as, as tragic as any of the stuff, or more tragic than you, than you, you, know, than you kind of heard about tonight. Oh, Niall mentioned the praise and the stick he got over the years. Mostly praise, I hope, for an amazing career. You brought the curtain down late last year. We're into April now, so this is the, maybe the time of the season that herders and footballers start thinking, hmm, did I make the right decision? Weather's getting a bit better, championship's starting up soon. Are you still comfortable? Do you miss it? Uh, I, I missed the train side of it and the discipline side of it, like, because I even see now I kind of hit the off button when I retired, to be honest <laughs> with you, and I even see resurrecting up old injuries, you know, back injury and groin injury and that, you know, and like, if you're in the mix of it, you know, you're doing the stretch and your diet is good, your discipline is good, you know, so like I'd miss that side of it now because, you know, when you let yourself go, it's harder to get back into the swing of things. But uh, towards the, uh, the middle of the season, I hope to get back playing club hurling. I'm carrying a bit of an injury at the minute, but hope to get back into it. But, you know, you missed the camaraderie with the lads and off air, you know, we were just talking to Richie there about, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the crack you have with the lads and the bond and all that. And yeah, you hear that from a lot of sports people. Do you mean around matches on match day, you're talking about in, in training? Because we would always assume that what you miss is playing in an all Ireland final more so than crack with, with a bunch of lads. Yeah, it's even, it's even in the physio room, like, you know, with the injured guys, like, they're laughing and joking mm-hmm. that you're doing in there. That's, you really get to know characters and uh, you know, that's what you'd miss about it. And, you know, it it's a grown-up's playground. It, it, being a part, of, being part of a club, <laughs> yeah. that's what it's like. And then you've got to go out and be this sort of gladiator and, and do the dead, thing for you. Right, yeah. But then when, you, when you all get back into your group and you, you kind of, you, you, you go through each other's emotions and, and, you mm-hmm. go, and the best way to do it is through humour and satire and fun. And uh, you rip the life out of each other, but it's, course, it's a yeah. bonding thing that, that you remember forever. And, and your dressing room, the Sunderland dressing room I was in, we, we had, uh, which I finished with, because then it was leaving, it was, I was losing, I was coming to the end, my career was over, and that's, I missed that camaraderie that we had. And it went from the young lads, sometimes the young players, who were kind of sharper with the sort of, I suppose, the slagging, if you like, you know, they'd be ripping the senior players yeah. apart, and it was great. You know, then you had a proper dressing room, and that's what I would miss. One of your teammates was Liam Brady internationally, our big guest tonight. Do you, what sort of stature did he have when you arrived in the Ireland squad? Well, I don't want to embarrass him, but total awe, and not, ju- <laughs> not, just, uh, not just me. Uh, and I have to describe the thing at the time. Jack took over, didn't get off to a great start. I got into the squad quite early in Jack's tenure. Uh, people weren't happy with him. There was, you know, it was far worse. The rugby lads were way ahead of us then. Uh, and Liam Brady used to come in from Italy where we'd watch him on TV playing in the, the biggest league in the world, scoring the winner for Juventus or whoever he was at, at the time, Inter or Sampdoria. And he'd come in and there would just be a presence around him and we were in total law. And he, he wouldn't say an awful lot in the, in the build-up in the two or three days, but what he did was, was chosen brilliantly and, and you would remember and it would, it would stick, stick in your head all through the game. And, and it, was, it, it was an amazing thing for me as a young player to have somebody like him coming in and saying, okay, because you don't feel right, I can, I can play in the same team as this guy, this, this, is, this is absolutely huge. And some funny things happened to Liam at that time, I mean, you know, you think about Saipan and trouble and balls and bibs not turning up. Liam, 
I can, and, and I know this for a fact, Jack Charlton told me this, that the FAI at one stage told Jack not to pick Liam for the friendlies because they, couldn't, they didn't want to pay his flights from Italy. <laughs> so, if I, so if anybody wanted to explode <coughs> and, and blow it, but he turned up time after time. And you'll actually, you can ask him yourself tonight, I think he paid one or two of his own, of his own at that time just to come back and play. And uh, it, it was a brilliant experience. And I, 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 every time I see him, I get into good humor. Just, oh, is this Liam? You know, yes. the, the Liam Brady <laughs> Saipan musical is here. In the <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we wrap up, any time we've had squad members from the uh, 2002 World Cup on the show, we present them with their own oversized Aircom call cards, <laughs> which were on sale. The time. There's uh, Richie and uh, Stephen Reid with their customized four euro call cards. Very happy with it, yes. And uh, now the thing is, you're our first ever much sought after seven euro <laughs> uh, much better than four euro <laughs> call card member. We thought it would be a lovely idea to get you a present of one too. But folks, it turns out he has one already, which we can all see there. <laughs> so, uh, so we decided the perfect present to get you instead is uh, this copy of uh, Bust the Opera. <laughs> <laughs> it's a four disc uh, commemorative box set. Uh, signed by Richie Sadler himself, uh, with the director's commentary by Richie Sadler. So, uh, folks, keep the applause going, yeah, please. Yeah. We have Richie Sadler and Owen Kenny. of a new series of Second Captains Live. And here's Ken Ernie with a brand new slot. Thank you, Owen, and uh, welcome to Degrading Irish Superstars Action with me, Ken Early. For those of you who didn't grow up with Superstars, it was a show of the 1970s and 80s that pitted Irish sporting gladiators against each other in unfamiliar ways. And so, to the banks of the lovely Lee, they came. Stars from every corner of the Irish sporting galaxy, from soccer, rugby, GEA, from trampolining, from weightlifting. And so, too, came the master of ceremonies, a man then arguably at the peak of his powers, Mr. James McGee. The athletes now must face their greatest test to impress world superstar supremo Brian Budd, a sadistic Canadian Adonis with muscles like steel cables, unlike our often weedy Irish competitors. The beef from the land of the maple leaf cows, the Irish heroes, with a terrifying demonstration of upper body strength. As long as that chin comes over and goes back down to a full hang, that is not a full hang. They feel it is. When they're on the bar, it is not. That is what it is. I will be very, very tough. Having established these brutal standards, Bud now puts the athletes through some initial paces. We can observe the debilitating effects of exercise on the Irish sportsman <laughs> as rugby star Vinnie Becker convulses at the back. The competitors are now ready for the first event, the 100 metre sprint. It's time to meet our first Superstars featured athlete. From Carp, the rugby star whose drop goal clinched the 1995 Triple Crown, Michael Kiernan. There is Michael in lane two as they crouch for the side of the sprint. And they're off, accelerating into the dry phase, and already a leader has emerged. Powerful ties, pumping like pistons. It's Michael Kiernan. He's blown the competition away. Let's hear what the commentator made of it. Michael Kiernan takes the sprint. Here we see them again. He was going powerful. He's a little overweight. The withering word leaves well. Michael crestfallen, and by the time he hits the basketball challenge, it's clear his head is gone. Michael Kiernan has been and almost gone in the basketball. <laughs> the laws and the airs from the sympathetic young audience. Nothing is more humiliating than the sympathy of children, which gushes over Kiernan as he finally puts it away after one, two, three, four, five attempts. Maybe a kind word from the body fascists in the commentary booth. With the ball a different shape, I doubt if Michael would struggle like that. Thanks for that, Jimmy. The ball was the wrong shape, but at least not out of shape, which so disgusted Jimmy's co-commentator earlier. So that was Hoop Nightmares with Michael Kiernan. But join us next week for our second featured athlete, one of the greats of Dublin football, a world superstars finalist, the legend, that is Bernard Brogan Sr. For the first time ever, we expose the resemblance between Bernard and Marge Simpson's former love interest, Artie Ziff. <laughs> All that on the next degrading Irish superstars action. Forward to a little more of that next week. If you told most footballers they could dominate an FA Cup final and win PFA Player of the Year, they'd be pretty happy with their lot. But for tonight's guest, that was only the start. He's an Irish football legend and the possessor of a pretty sweet left foot right up to the final ever game of league football he played. We've got Liam Brady out here after the break. <laughs> Ladies, and 
get on the score sheet. That's my own. Oh, Tonight is in the hands of our big guest. The top ten is on your screens now, but it's tradition for us here in Second Captains Live to acclaim our wonderful studio audience through the medium of John Milan's skills of hurling tea towels. Mm, As course. always, we ask the crowd here this evening for the sporting highlight of their own career. They look even more pathetic than last I week's uh, lot, Murph. Got any tragic entries for us? Well, I'll be honest, John, they are pretty loserish. On this week's live TV counselling session, we have Laura Caspara. Uh, Laura, if you're in the house, who says, uh, During the Ireland and Spain qualifier in 1989, I lost one of my shoes when the crowd surged forward on the south terrace of Lansdowne Road. Couldn't find it at the end of the game until I walked out in one shoe and saw it on the roof of a chip van outside the ground. Uh, Donald Murta is also here. Donald, uh, he says, he scored a goal with my keeper in sensible soccer, which actually is, oh, well, that is pretty, pretty impressive. impressive actually, yeah. uh, but uh, tonight's loser in chief is Ryan O'Hagan. Uh, Ryan writes, I was playing my second game of the season for the under 10s local rugby team. My mum had washed my white jersey with her red shirt and it had ran in the wash. So I had to go to the match in a wine-coloured jersey. As a kid who couldn't pronounce his oars growing up and whose name is Ryan, that wasn't a good combination. Ended up being called Wyan for the rest oh. of the season. Well, he does indeed get a John Milan uh, Skills of Hurling commemorative tea towel. So a round of applause, please. Ryan, Ryan O'Hagan. Hello, Ryan. Is everybody ready for our big guest? Well, you should be because he's one of the greatest sportsmen we've ever produced. An icon at Arsenal, a hero for Ireland and a legend in Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Liam Brady! <laughs> Liam, how are you? Hello. You can take a seat there, any of those seats. Great to have you on, first of all. Thanks very much for calling into us. Now, we mentioned, the, Niall Quinn mentioned your move to Italy, amongst other things, which was a pretty big move to make at that time. But can you take us back to the start? Did you always have a, an independent streak as a kid? Uh, well, I suppose I did, because uh, it's a big move to go to England when you're 15. Um, I remember when I was about 14, I was supposed to go to Arsenal on trial and there was some uh, uh, frost on the roads and the uh, Arsenal scout was supposed to pick me up and take me to the airport, never arrived. So I ran out onto the Santry Road, got a bus up to the airport and made sure I was going to <laughs> Arsenal. So I think, I think that shows uh, I was pretty independent minded. And you also uh, played a, a soccer match for your school, I should say for the Republic of Ireland under the threat of expulsion from your school. That's certainly how the story goes, is that accurate? That's true, yeah. Can yeah. you tell us what happened? Uh, I was a pretty good Gaelic player. We were at a good Gaelic school, St Aidan's, CBS in Whitehall. And uh, we had this challenge match against uh, uh, Galway team. Is it St Charlotte's? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Murph's old school actually. Yeah, but there was nothing on it. It was just a challenge match, you know. Uh, but I had been picked to play for Ireland as uh, uh, as uh, an under-15 and captained the team in Wales. And um, the head brother told me if I miss the match against St. Jarlitz, don't come back to the school. Right. It turned into quite a big drama, that that's story. I mean, it was in the papers and all sorts of stuff. It was. I wasn't very pleased with my father. He went to the newspapers and I ended up with my picture on the front of the Evening Herald. <laughs> was it not a sympathetic I, I account? I had a really the... bad haircut. So <laughs> <laughs> were, they, were they slamming you for, for not playing Gaelic football? I mean, did you actually ever consider no, not playing? No, no, My father, in fact, exposed uh, the Christian brothers for, um, you know, being so biased, really, you know. Any other school would, would be pleased that their, one of their pupils was going to captain his, his country, wouldn't you think so? I would have thought, thought so, so yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you ever consider actually doing what they were telling you to do? Not playing in the soccer game, not playing the match, right? No, no way, no. 
Uh, and I'm still in touch with St. Aidan's, so I get on very, very well with the people there, and we've actually got a soccer team in St. Aidan's. <laughs> Is it true, Liam, that you... I've read that you followed individual players growing up. Most young lads probably support, and young girls support teams. Really align themselves with what you look more at individuals? Yeah, I did, yeah. Although I probably if I had, to, uh, had to admit to it, I was a bit of a Manchester United fan because uh, they had probably the three... <laughs> <laughs> no, they... I, I, like, uh, I grew up... Uh, I was... Uh, in 66, England won the World Cup. I was 10. And then Man United won the league in 65 and 67 and they had George Best, Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law. And for me, they were, like, the best players around. So I leaned towards that. But I also like uh, Johnny Giles, Rodney Marsh, uh, Charlie George at Arsenal. Yeah. These so. are real glory players you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Individuals. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that, Ken? Nothing at all. I, I mean, you, as a, as a player, uh, had a, I mean... You know, your, your most famous game for Arsenal is probably the, the 79 Cup final. And you were involved in these the three goals. I mean, it's just one example of a game, but each time dribbling the ball in midfield in a kind of position you don't often see uh, players, you know, start dribbling in midfield like that. How did you sort of become that type of player? Well, it's, it's a rare thing to see. I think I've, uh, I was always uh, a dribbler of the ball. I was always uh, very happy to take players on and try and beat them and things like that, make things happen. Um, but obviously, as you go into the professional game and, and you, you're up against very, very difficult opponents and uh, you can't always dribble, so you, you learn to play one and two touch and um, th that's what I did, you know. Uh, you learn the game. And I have Arsenal to thank for, for teaching me the game, the professional game. I went there at 15 and left when I was 24. You've heard, I've heard you talk before about the, the using a game as a, as a kind of a form of self-expression, or, you know, to express yourself. What are you expressing when you do, you know, self-expression in what way? Uh, I suppose to, to entertain, to score a goal. Um, that's what I used to love more than anything, was to score a goal, make a goal. If you watch Lionel Messi now, that's self-expression, isn't it? You know, he gets the ball and he's going to make things happen. Uh, and I'd like to think that I was that kind of player, you know, who would, who would take people on and go past people and make things happen, end product, was, make a goal, score a goal. It was a style that was loved by Arsenal fans. You mentioned your time there. Uh, Fever Pitch, one of the most famous sports books ever written by Nick Hornby, has a chapter devoted to you entitled Liam Brady. This is the, have you read that? Personally? I have, yeah. I know, Nick as well. I know Nick as well. I know Nick as well. You must I have enjoyed being a... Yeah, it was nice, yeah. Chapter. It was nice, yeah. I like probably the most... Uh, the, the best thing I liked about Nick was recognising that I was a great Bob Dylan fan. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily what he thought about me as a footballer. Did really. that make it, that sort of devotion that Arsenal fans had for you, did that make it difficult when, you, when the crunch time came and you decided, I'm leaving the club, I'm leaving the country? Uh, no, I was up front with the Arsenal fans. I told them a year before my contract expired that I was going to leave, and I think they uh, understood, they appreciated it. Keegan had gone to Germany a couple of years before. Tony Woodcock had left a year before me, um, and I decided I wanted to go abroad and, uh, and see how I got on. I remember Ken Fryer, uh, who was secretary of Arsenal, saying to me, yeah, but you're going to a foreign country. And I said, I'm in a foreign country already. <laughs> <laughs> but it was seen as such a big move. An, an English player moving to Italy at that time would have been a big deal. You'd gone from Dublin, gone to London, then to Turin yeah. to play for Juventus. And this is a time, nowadays, You've got a player who will come to the Premier League from another country and transport his family there and transport his everything there, really, his whole culture. You didn't have that. Did you have to just immerse yourself into what the Italians were doing? Yeah, that's right. I could only say spaghetti bolognese. That was all I could say. <laughs> um, uh, but they were very good to me. They looked after me. The, the, the players, particular, particularly Marco Tardelli, was an excellent friend. Uh, Trapattoni was my manager. Um, and... You know, I, when I think back, uh, I got this apartment and I got, got this stereo uh, that Trapattoni had helped organise, but I couldn't set it up, and he came around the house and fixed it all for me. He was lying on the floor on the carpet, uh, 
putting wires in here. This is Giovanni see. Trapattoni. This is Giovanni Trapattoni. <laughs> swear to God. Yeah. yeah, swear to God. He wanted me to settle in. It was in his interest. Roberto Bedica had a story about, uh, I think, the first game he played for Juventus. Um, uh, and he was quite struck, and a lot of the players were struck by the fact that immediately before the game, he went and shook all of the guys by the hand. I was wondering, is that, uh, was that just something that you did before every game and you were surprised that they didn't do it there? No, it wasn't something that I did before every game. I just thought, first game, you know, I want them to accept me. I was pleased to be with them and uh, I just wanted to show them. How soon do you, how, how long do you think it, that actually took before you, you felt, yeah, I'm the only foreigner in a team of Italians and I feel like I'm one of these players now? Um, I think uh, I didn't get off to the best of starts, Ken. You know, I was, I was in and out the first six, seven games. I, and there was a few question marks whether I had been the right signing or not. And then I got off to, uh, uh, to what I call my be one of my best games was against Inter Milan. And we beat them 2-1. One day had been the champions the year before. And it was a big, big result for us. And I scored a goal and made a goal. And um, after that, I think everything was was hunky-dory, as they say. You uh, won, yeah. The, the fans accepted me, they got on my side, the players were convinced that I could help them win the championship, and it was, it was great from then on. You did win the championship in your first season, you were closing in another one in your second season. I think three games remained of that campaign when you were called in by the Juventus president at that time to be delivered some bad news. Yeah, I'd already had the bad news from an agent in England, uh, and I didn't believe him that... Uh, they were, Juventus were going to sign Platini and I was, um, I was out. So I went to see Trapattoni after, uh, after a training session and Trap said he didn't know anything about it, but I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I went to see the president um, and um, he started crying. So then I knew it was true. Right. <laughs> And that was a shock to you? Well, not a shock. No, I want to say, it was a joke. He, was, he, he, he <laughs> pretended he was very emotional. But, <laughs> crocodile uh, tears, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, the guy who was calling the shots at Juventus at the time was Gianni Agnelli, who owns Fiat and owned a lot of the industry in northern Italy. And uh, he wanted Platini. And the president was just, you know, had to, had to do his job. But uh, I left in the best circumstances. By slamming home a penalty to win another title? I don't know whether I slammed it. But yeah, it was it a went, stroke to the goalkeeper. It, it, it went right in. It, it, went it, in. Like it was probably surprised. the most nerve-wracking penalty I ever took. Was yeah. it? The, you, the press seemed to react in, in a way that they were surprised you didn't take your revenge on Juventus in the spot by missing the penalty. Yeah, they said um, uh, it, it was a, a great, a great uh, way of behaving. It was great professionalism. But I was thinking of the, of the bonus for winning the league. <laughs> 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 we, you had an unbelievable Ireland career. Uh, you can maybe confirm or deny Niall Quinn's opinion earlier that's, on. That's, I don't know where Quinny got that no? one No? No, no, no. You're, you're OK to come home for yeah, friendlies? No, the, the FAI always played my fair. The relationship you had with Jack Charlton towards the end was obviously uh, not great. It didn't end well for you after being our biggest player during the 1980s. Was the independence streak that we talked about there, the ability to make big decisions off the pitch in your life and also on the pitch, is that what created an issue with Jack Charlton who might have preferred a, a bunch of more obedient footballers? No, I think it was the style of, of player I was that, that Jack would ultimately have a problem with. You see, Jack got the job in about 86, uh, 85, 86, and we, were, we had a very difficult group to qualify for the European... Uh, uh, the Euros in 88, uh, we had Belgium, we had Bulgaria, we had Scotland, a bit similar to the group we're in at the moment. And uh, we were up against it. But against all the odds, and I played in all the eight games, and only eight teams qualified, and like now, 24 teams are going to qualify, only eight teams qualified. And against all the odds, we qualified, and I played in every single game. But just at the end, I got injured and I ruptured my crucial ligament and I was never the same player after that. And Jack knew that and uh, on top of that Andy Townsend began to come, Ronnie Whelan began to come, I was pushing 32, 33, so uh, that's how that drifted away. Although I wasn't his kind of player, he was happy to have me when I was playing well and as I say I played in every single game to qualify for that 88 championship. Does that 
hurt now though because it ended quite spectacularly you were substituted early on in a game against Germany uh, at the time I'm sure an end of an international career is painful no, but when you look back now at your career at this stage you're I don't hold grudges or I don't bear grudges or I don't you know Jack was a great manager for Ireland he wasn't a great manager for me he was a great manager for Ireland and they did very very well and there was nobody more pleased than you know how we performed in 1990 uh, than myself uh, I was sorry that I wasn't there, but he wasn't the manager for me. I couldn't have performed um, uh, the way I would have liked to have performed playing for Jack Charlton. If I had been another manager, I might have been a starter in the team. Yeah. Well, listen, it was an un unbelievable international career and an amazing career everywhere you played. Liam Brady, everybody! <laughs> Hopefully you'll be giving this next bit a little bit of thought. You can stand up and we'll have a look at the good wall. Top 10 greatest Irish sports people. Murph, how's that looking? Uh, well, right now we have uh, Roy Keane at number 10, Paul O'Connell is 9, the new entry from last week, Paul McGrath is 8, Ron Nogara, George Best, top 5 then of AP McCoy, Katie Taylor, Rory McIlroy, uh, last week's big mover, uh, Henry Shefflin and Brian O'Driscoll at number 1. I should mention that one Liam Brady was on here until yeah, last week. Luke, Luke Fitzgerald, the Irish rugby player, took you down. <laughs> OK, well, I might take a rugby player. <laughs> you can put yourself back up. Let's find out who you're bringing in, first of all. Who's going into this top ten? Uh, Johnny Giles. Johnny Giles. <laughs> Seems like a popular, uh, big influence on your career. A big influence on my career, but when I was growing up, I would watch him play for Ireland, watch him play for Leeds United, and he was uh, a great, a great, great footballer. Probably the best footballer that Ireland's ever produced. I know Paul's up there. Uh, well, best probably in the, in the island of Ireland is the best we've produced, but certainly in the Republic of Ireland, I would say John is the best we've had. All right, Johnny Giles is going in there. Who's coming out? How high do you want to put him? Uh, I'll stick him in at number 10 and I'll take the fella from Cork. Roy Keane! Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh. <laughs> and you don't feel Roy Keane is deserving of a place in the top? Well, as a, as a Manchester United player, probably yes, but as, as an Irish player, no. Right, OK. Controversial. <laughs> one more quick change if you want to make one. Uh, switch it up, up, uh, up or down? Yeah, well, you can put somebody, you can do whatever you want there, just very quickly. Uh, O'Gara drop out and McGrath up. McGrath up into <laughs> okay, seven, no, O'Gara okay, we'll yeah, at yeah. eight. We'll leave it there. Liam Brady, everybody. Yeah. We'll take a seat again, Liam. Murph, what have you got for us this week? Well, uh, just got time for one very quick clip on. Um, we've seen the lavish theatrical productions featuring uh, Richie and Nod earlier, but it's actually the acting career of one Liam Brady uh, which really blew us away. It's the run up to the 1990 World Cup, and Liam and Kevin Moran uh, just finished their stint as extras in Dynasty, judging by the size of their shoulder pads. My and uh, they, <laughs> they forego a trip to Pizza Lad because they've got business to attend to with another Dynasty extra. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Whether you're coming or going, you can get traveller's checks and foreign currency notes from any Irish permanent branch office. How are your foreign languages coming on? No problem. Puro de change. Ah, classic. <laughs> so, I have to say, in the pantheon of pre-World uh, Cup Irish football team ads, the quality of acting uh, in this one is actually right up there. But unfortunately for Liam, and indeed Kevin, the call from Hollywood on never, never came. came. But uh, still, a performance like that deserves some acclaim. So uh, come on, everyone, please. Liam, Liam and Kevin. There were ugly scenes on Shannon's second captains last week as Murph was left wounded and bloody by a stunning Sean Coleman comeback tonight. Tipperary's most ruthless predator, Owen Kelly, goes in for the kill. Pick a winner at home if you want to grab a second captain's t-shirt. Tweet Team Murph or Team Kelly now. Challenge second captains is coming up after the break. <laughs> He's on the second, second captain in the team. Second captain, first captain, whatever. Welcome back to Second Captain's Live, and you join us for the most disturbing slot on Irish television someday soon. Murph is bound to discover his pride and shout stop, but in the meantime. He scored just the 21 goals and 368 points in Championship hurling. But that entire legacy is on the line tonight. Please welcome Tipperary goal door, Owen Kelly. <laughs> Mr. Bombastic. Nice 
musical choice center that falls for us. Boom Bastic by Shaggy. Ladies and gentlemen, still the champion after a highly controversial draw with Sean Cronin last week. He puts the mean into 32-year-old man getting demeaned on live television. Tonight, he's Ireland's best-loved mascot that we've all pretty much forgotten. El Quiz Sensacion, Kieran McCool Murphy. Go on, Kieran. Oh! Oh, God. Get your face to the podium, Kieran. Oh, looking good. This is, this is a fucking wolf. Can't thing. hear a thing. I want to get that off you. This audience has been split in two. If you've got a Team Murph ticket, let's hear you. <laughs> what about Team Kelly? Where are you? Hey. Ooh, not much support for you, Owen. Only the winning oh. team will leave the studio with the second captain's t shirt. Sorry. Your chosen category tonight, it. fellas, is hurling. If you get an answer right, you earn a point. If you get it wrong, you lose a point. And the winner will walk out with the ultimate prize. Tell them all about it, Ken Early. <laughs> You know what they call Mikasa Super Grip Gloves in Paris? They call them Mikasa Super Grip Gloves. The soft wool glove body ensures the tenderest touch. See how that dead skin flakes gently off. Adhesive dimples provide the grip of a thousand men. Rip that shower rail right out of the socket. That's why Mikasa's number one for mythical brush cover number one, Stay Kips Shane Kerr. This is Owen's chance to finally own a pair of Mikasas. As always, the second captain, Super Home Simon Hick, will act as independent referee and guardian of the Mikasas. He'd have to prize that briefcase from his cold, dead, albeit beautifully tanned hands. Let's hear you, folks. You really want those T-shirts? <laughs> Fingers on the buzzers. Our minute starts now. Name the top three championship scorers in history. Murph. Uh, Owen Kelly, Eddie Kerr, Henry Shefflin. Correct. Who won more All-Stars? Henry Shefflin. Incorrect. In 2014, Tipperary or Kilkenny? Uh, Tipperary. Correct. Former tip hurler Bobby Ryan endorsed... Z Z Zeofen. Yes! Hey. Who won the community games under 12 long puck in 1970? No, yes! <laughs> After Kilkenny, Cork and Tip, which counties... Murph? Uh, Limerick. Yes, won the most senior All-Irelands. When was the last time Cork won a... Um, 2005. Yes, Owen. How many All-Stars did Henry Shefflin win? 11. Oh, Murph got there first. Oh. Uh, I'm probably going to say 11. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Hawkeye denied John O'Dwyer an All-Ireland winning point last year, but what is his nickname? Mur Murph. Bubbles. Yes, Bubbles. Oh, 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 Murph, yes. Owen Kelly won six All-Stars. Yes. Yes, Owen Kelly. Last one, last one, 2010. Incorrect. When did he win his first? <laughs> oh. uh, I'm going to say 2001. Cap, first cap, whatever. Correct. The well yeah. <laughs> That's it for most of this evening, folks. Well, Team Murph for the T-shirts. We do have a Twitter king to finalise, I think, Ken, if you want to get through that. Uh, yeah, no, and it comes in from Tim Ward, who posted this photograph with the tweet, Niall Quinn, back when he was in the Inspiral Carpets. Oh. So he is our Twitter king for the evening. Tim Ward, consider yourself ratified. Thanks so much to all our guests. Thank you very much as well. We're all off to watch that Richie Sadler opera. You coming with us? Yeah, why not? We'll see you all next Wednesday night. Good night, folks. <laughs>